as many of you know cppib has not only been investing in india since several years but also has a beautiful office in bombay coincidentally the inauguration of the office was announced at one of the fiki conferences by then ceo of cppib way back 5 years ago cppib is the canada's largest pension fund and one of the largest fund managers globally managing around 500 billion canadian dollars and projected to cross a trillion canadian dollars by 2032 it invests the funds of more than 20 million canadian contributors more importantly it has so far invested around 12 billion canadian dollars in india ladies and gentlemen we couldn't have had a better person than alan carl career senior managing director head of international head of europe cpp investment out of uh, based out of london to speak to us today alan good afternoon to you afternoon sunil please alan has more than 27 years of uh, financial services uh, industry experience prior to joining cpp uh, in 2008 he was managing director at goldman sachs uh, in the investment banking division in new york and london and uh, coincidentally again we worked together at, uh, at goldman sachs during those days alan uh, a very very warm welcome to you in india though virtually though uh, just to give you a little bit of background uh, this is uh, fiki's capital markets flagship capital markets conference called capm 2021 Uh, we host this annually for the last 18 years and uh, today we have more than 1100 participants registered participants and across the across the globe given the paucity of time i'll restrict my comments uh, here and i would request uh, uh, alan to to deliver your keynote address over to you alan Many thanks Sunil uh and for such a warm welcome it's it's always great to be in India even if uh, only virtually uh and I can't wait to be there in person and thanks for inviting me to Fiki's annual gathering of business leaders I'm really delighted to join you um and so I I thought about two themes today uh for, for this for this address one emerging opportunities which can drive India's growth in a post pandemic a uh, world and then the importance of india for a global investor like cbp investments um which uh, as you and i discussed uh in it, we are uh, very very bullish uh, on india generally so if i start with what we see as emerging opportunities uh in india post pandemic specifically i think it's clear to everyone that covid-19 brought major disruptions uh and changes around the world and some of these shifts were already in motion uh before the pandemic emerged if you think about it the acceleration of technology shift of economic growth from the west to the east urbanization shifting supply chains and significant demographic changes uh this was all happening but i think it's also clear now that a number of these shifts uh, are accelerating and the pandemic and the way of working and and the economic disruptions are now pushing some of these themes a lot faster and years ahead of where we thought we might be at this point in time you look at the acceleration of e-commerce e-learning telehealth drug and vaccine discovery um great examples in 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 the covid vaccine that's all moving us moving us closer to the future uh and if you went back 10 years I, you know i don't think anyone would have predicted where we are along some of these trends today and some of these shifts uh will be permanent i think there's no doubt about that and india is very well positioned to benefit from a number of these new opportunities if you think about india's economy in the near term clearly that's been affected by the pandemic but the macro fundamentals of india remain very strong look at demographics 66% of india's population is in the 15 to 35 age bracket uh, massive consumer bulge urbanization uh, india's cities will contribute 70% of india's gdp by 2030 and then mass co- consumerism Uh, that flows from that 65% of the gdp is through private consumption and then you talk about technology 
uh, technology adoption in India uh, is fantastic, and you have 800 million internet users now. Uh, there's massive uh, and significant growth over the last few years, and that basically fuels a number of the other themes. So speaking of themes, I'll mention four today that we have a, a keen eye on. The rise in consumption, diversification of supply chains, infrastructure asset recycling, and then sustainable energy growth. Um, and if you, if you start with the rise in consumption, look at India's GDP per capita, which is now probably around 2,000 US dollars, um, and, and roughly where China was in 2005, 2006. And I know these comparisons are tricky and dangerous, uh, but if you look at history and, and where uh, China uh, you know, took off and the point that it took off from, and look at you know, South Korea as well, when these economies were at similar stage of development as India as uh, today, that's when they really took, you know, uh, shifted another gear. And that upward trajectory is far from guaranteed in India. And, and you can hear a number of people list a number of uh, you know, issues as to why you can't really compare the two. But we think, and we're quite convinced, that it's actually indicative of the country's future potential. And if you think of direct-to-consumer companies, digital and tech companies disrupting legacy business models, uh, that's been happening in India. It will continue to happen. That is here to stay. And that's going to be a key player uh, in that economic growth. And then you look at diversification of supply chains. Again, a trend uh, that is playing uh, to India's potential. You look at supply chains that are being reshaped, diversified as companies look to secure resilience in their supply chain and remain competitive. It's not a narrow focus. We've talked about reshoring a lot, but actually businesses are moving parts of their supply chains to different markets and expanding supply base to diversify risk. And if you look at global trade and, and production that begins to shift, India could emerge as a major supply chain hub. However, uh, there are a few conditions to that. And I think we're, we're very focused uh, on, on the signs of, of, these, of these changes. If you look at India's large workforce, training is very important. You need to train the workforce to suit the needs of different sectors, uh, and that will allow you to offer uh, competitive cost of labor, but also skilled labor in order to, to, to achieve that uh, supply chain disruption. Private investment can and should be boosted in the transport infrastructure of India, like ports, airports, and, 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 and container depots. That's usually what people refer to when they think that you need, the, the, the domestic infrastructure is key to expanding um, India's production base. And next to that, you have a very large domestic market that can act as a supplement to the export potential for international manufacturers, again, if infrastructure allows access to that market efficiently. And I think we need to highlight uh, the increased efforts by the government to attract FDI in manufacturing, targeting production-linked in incentives, which is, which is critical uh, within that. On the third point, uh, which is something, again, that we've been looking at uh, very closely at CPP, which is infrastructure asset recycling. Uh, this is critical to unleashing capital uh, and to allow India to fulfill its growth potential uh, and the global competitiveness that would come from that. And I think we have to highlight the government's targets, uh, ambitious targets to spend 1.4 trillion US dollars on infrastructure by 2025 through the National Infrastructure Pipeline, NIP. Uh, this is a very important effort. Uh, and infrastructure spending in the context of what I just referred to is more important than ever for India. Um, when you look at what the IMF uh, studies concluded that during times of high uncertainty, increasing public investments by 1% of GDP can boost GDP growth by 2.7%. Uh, so private investments by 10% and employment by 1.2% all critical factors for India. And then the recycling of the government infrastructure assets would be critical uh, to monetize existing roads, ports, transmission grids, telecom towers, pipelines, could improve the fiscal deficit and also offer uh, asset classes that are very uh, sought after by large uh, international investors. And so speaking of ourselves as one of those investors, We've been actively involved in the asset monetization subcommittee that was led by the NIIF uh, under the, uh, the Interministerial Task Force for the NIP. 
this has been a very, very worthwhile exercise. Uh, and in August 2020, as you will know, Sunil, the subcommittee presented a report uh, on how the government can implement a large-scale asset recycling model. And that would tap the interests of institutional investors such as CPPIB by providing assets that we can value uh, and that we can spend a lot of money and then free up capital for the government uh, in order to develop new, uh, new infrastructure. And so on this theme, we've been actually working quite closely with the Indian government. Uh, we've launched India's first private invit, uh, the in Infravit, to acquire operating road assets. And we're also the anchor investor in the Power Grid Corporation's invit uh, for transmission lines. Uh, all great initiatives that are helping to open up and offer opportunities for international investors. And so on the fourth uh, theme now, if you allow me, sustainable energy growth. Sustainable energy, not surprisingly, is one of the fastest growing part of CPPIB's uh, portfolio. It's, uh, it's something that is critical to our development, but also a, a very, very significant focus uh, of the organization globally. And in India, there's significant opportunities. Um, India is expected to triple its renewable energy generation capacity by 2030. And uh, to achieve this, will require significant investment, and we think a lot of it will have to come from international investors. I think we're talking in the vicinity of 500 to 700 billion dollars over the next few years. You need government, uh, favorable policies from government, uh, and we have that. Uh, renewable energy projects for priority sector lending, building power transmission lines to support distributed generation, which is key when, when talking about uh, renewables, and allowing 100% FDI uh, under uh, automatic route for renewable projects is also very important in, in attracting foreign capital. And then uh, add to that uh, electric vehicles and EV charging infrastructure as significant opportunities with energy storage, batteries, and new energy sources like hydrogen, uh, where Europe, uh, incidentally, is playing a large role in, in developing uh, this new source of power. They're all expected to be areas attracting significant private investment. Uh, and as I said earlier, we have a, a, a department called Sustainable Energies Group, which is focusing exclusively on these areas and spending a lot of time uh, in India. And as I said, uh, a very important facilitator for the above themes is attracting more foreign capital. And we're very pleased uh, on that score to see numerous in initiatives by the government uh, to attract patient foreign capital. Um, and uh, incidentally, in 2020, India bucked the, the, the global FDI trend by growing 13%, even if uh, as FDI globally collapsed uh, by, by, I think, a number close to 42%. So that was a very good sign. And also looking at COVID-19, uh, India surged ahead of most emerging markets in terms of net uh, FDI inflows, uh, with numbers close to 40 billion US dollars in, in, in fiscal year 2020 alone, which is a strong indication of the recovery of the economy, but also the attractiveness of the market and some of the themes I just mentioned uh, playing very, very positively with foreign investors. So if I can now turn to uh, my second big topic, which is our investment philosophy at CPPIB and the importance of India as a market uh, to a global investor like us. Uh, when we think uh, of CPP, what we like to put forward as our philosophy is long-term investing as a frame of mind. It's not a holding period, it's a culture. Um, it's, it's an approach. It's about making investment decisions uh, with a sustainable future-oriented perspective. Uh, and so that means you need to be persistent through periods of underperformance uh, and you need to be patient, which is something we can do uh, given the way we are structured and given the way capital flows into, into our fund. And we also have a unique governance structure, uh, which is quite different from uh, a sovereign wealth fund, for instance. We're at arm's length from government. Our management team reports to an independent professional board of directors. And so we're not encumbered by political agendas and we're somewhat insulated from political interference, which was at the core uh, foundational to CPPIB uh, and is critical to our uh, decision making. We also have something that we think is quite unique called the total portfolio uh, management approach. With a long horizon, we have certainty of assets. We know for 
25 years, roughly how much capital will flow into the fund and how much capital will flow out of the fund uh, to sustain the CPP. And that's a long horizon and a certainty of asset that means that we can take uh, prudent uh, long-term uh, positions and absorb short-term changes in investment values as we look through market cycles. Uh, I would also mention our investment-only mandate. Um, we have been given a very, very clear mandate by uh, the Canadian government at the time, which is to maximize long-term investment returns without undue risk of loss. We do not have to take into account uh, social or political uh, goals, and frankly, we look uh, to build a global investment organization uh, that will maximize returns for Canadian pensioners. Uh, and, and we look through that prism, have flexibility to deploy our capital as we see fit. Uh, that leads to a distinctive ability to pursue a very diverse set of investment strategies, either the direct equity, structured equity, credit, uh, listed, unlisted, a very flexible first uh, full service capital provider. I, I jokingly tell most people that if you can think of an investment strategy, we likely have it in house or have had it or are about to develop it uh, because we think diversification is key, not only geographically, but across types of risk within the portfolio. And that actually brings a lot of dividends. When you look at uh, the volatility of 2021, We've actually achieved our strong, strongest ever annual return of 20.4% across the entire portfolio for fiscal year 21. Uh, our total portfolio, as you said earlier, Sunil, is, is approximately $500 billion Canadian. 85% of our investments are outside Canada, and almost 30% are in the broader Asia Pacific region. And with this, we're on track to be a trillion dollar fund uh, in the early 2030s. Uh, and it will keep growing after that. Uh, and so uh, when you look at this, being global, being an investor of scale uh, is very important and emerging markets uh, are a significant part of our growth strategy. By 2025, our goal is to have approximately one third of our fund invested in emerging markets, which include India, China, uh, and other markets uh, around the world. Uh, and by that time, you would assume that that the, the, the portion of the fund that would be invested in emerging market could be uh, close to $200 billion. Uh, so India will be critical uh, to that growth. Uh, India uh, will see significant growth in our focus on assets, but also in our people on the ground. Uh, as I told you uh, in the pre-call we had, our Mumbai office uh, has been the fastest growing office uh, at CPPIB over the last couple of years, and probably will remain so for some time. Um, I think you mentioned kindly that we have approximately $12 billion already invested in India. So there's quite a, a, a significant uh, room for growth uh, within that portfolio. And we're also focused on building a very diversified uh, and resilient portfolio in India. Uh, and we'll continue to grow it through direct investments, fund investments, LP secondaries, partnerships, infrastructure, uh, re you know, real estate. Uh, th th this is across basically our entire strategies. And despite the pandemic, our, the last fiscal year has been probably one of our best years across strategies. And we've committed over two billion Canadian dollars in India. Uh, and we're very, off to a very good start in this current fiscal year with roughly a billion dollars already committed. Um, and you probably will uh, have seen some of the names uh, and recognize some of the names of our investments. A, a, a billion dollar invested in Flipkart, uh, India's largest e-commerce company, We've invested in the National Stock Exchange of India. We were uh, part of a SPAC listing of Renew Power, one of India's leading clean energy companies. We're the largest anchor investor in, in the power grid Invit. Uh, we participated in the Take Private of Rituza, an IT services business, invested in office space uh, with RMZ and uh, the acquisition of credit financing. And, and we made a fun investments in uh, BPEA's mid market credit fund. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention one of our most successful investments in India and a good example of long-term investing mindset, uh, which was our investment in Kotak Mahindra Bank. Uh, we first invested in Kotak in 2013. And since then the stock price has gone uh, from rupees 340 to 1700, uh, which it is today. 
And we've added to our position a number of times over the last eight years and now own approximately six and a half percent of the bank. Um, so we, in summary, uh, I would say to Sunil uh, that we're incredibly uh, proud of what we've achieved uh, in India. Uh, we think uh, our position, uh, our portfolio and our team uh, will keep growing significantly. We look forward uh, to partnering uh, with uh, a number of Indian businesses, uh, and we also look forward to a very productive relationship uh, with the Indian government uh, and a number of its agencies, uh, which have been incredibly helpful uh, in our growth. I'll probably stop here, uh, given the time, uh, and maybe to turn to questions if, uh, if you have any. <clears throat> this was brilliant. Uh, and thank you for that. Thank you for delivering your keynote address. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we probably have time for two questions because I know Alan has to leave for a, 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 a investment committee meeting. So please feel free to put in your question in the chat box. I'm going to pick up the questions from there. Um, so while people are thinking about the question, Alan, one thing uh, I totally agree with you, CPP, India treats CPP as a partner. Uh, your uh, commitment to NIIF, uh, which is a long-term commitment, and uh, also many of the assets which you talked about, we obviously know all the names, um, and and your commitment as an office. I, as I mentioned in my opening comments, uh, it was 2015, if I'm not wrong, uh, uh, Mark Wiseman announced the opening of CPP office uh, in India at our uh, CAPM conference of 2015. Um, so, and since then it has grown significantly. Uh, you mentioned about internet user in India. Uh, it's a very interesting one. General perception of CPP is long-term infrastructure related asset investor. Um, I was watching your interview on, on Mint, uh, which was fascinating. And you talked about multiple things, including your investment in some of the digital assets digitization program. Uh, you talked about Flipkart. Um, would you want to talk about that? Uh, because that is slightly different than the perception of infrastructure investor. Uh, thanks, Sunil. Sorry, I, I had to unmute uh, quickly. Yeah, I, I, I do know that people think of us as infrastructure investors. And actually, the first investment we made in India I was responsible for uh, was um, with uh, Larson and Tubro uh, in, in their roads, uh, toll road portfolio. So I, I understand why people think of us as a large infrastructure investor. We probably are actually the largest infrastructure investor in the world in terms of um, the size of our, of our portfolio. But, but when, and it's important that you mention that, when we think about India, uh, we think uh, about uh, you know much beyond infrastructure. Actually, we we think that India, from a digital economy standpoint, is is going to be one of the most exciting market to invest in for a number of different reasons. And that's if I mention five factors that we think will drive the growth of that market uh, in India and why we're so focused on it. Let me let me talk about uh, technological adoption. I mean, India is now, as I mentioned earlier, 800 million internet users. 200 million online shoppers and that number is increasing every year the rapid adoption of smartphones in, in, in recent years i mean that that, that growth has, has, has been nothing short of spectacular you know i think there's 50 million units shipped last quarter alone and fueled by a very affordable uh internet services you know two times cheaper than, than in china for instance that's helped uh, add new online shoppers at, at, a, at a very, very rapid pace. And then you have also, which is almost a cliche, uh, but critical, the availability of top tech talent in India. It is home to a thriving ecosystem. Over 3 million software developers. The, the world, the entire world goes to India to tap um, that talent. And that engineering talent you know, has been developed over uh, three decades by the IT industry in your country. It's one of the largest globally. It offers a wide variety of technical skills and capabilities and is lower cost to most Western countries. And so puts you in very, very strong position uh, to, to be a very, very important player uh, in, 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 in that booming ecosystem. And then turn to that ecosystem again. It's the startup ecosystem in India is growing 
uh, at an unprecedented, unprecedented pace. Uh, the, the pace of new company formation is very impressive. Inno innovation in a variety of sectors um, has meant a surge in, in what we call sunicorns and unicorns. Uh, so if you, if you're, according to NASCOM, I think there's 1,600 new startups are founded during the pandemic, uh, taking the toll to the country to you know, more than 12,000. Uh, and 55 to 60 of them were, were identified as sunicorns, soon to be unicorns. Uh, this is incredibly exciting. Uh, I think in 2020, 2021, India added 11 unicorns, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and India, I think, is expected, or at least that's what Bloomberg says, to contribute 25% of the new unicorns by 2025. And the top 100 companies in digital and tech sectors are expected to be valued at between one to one and a half trillion US dollars. I mean, these numbers are probably going to be off by some, but it gives you an idea of the scale of the opportunity and how fast that opportunity is growing. Um, and you have a maturing investor landscape against that. Uh, you know, India ranked, I think, second in P deal value in 2020 with almost $40 billion raised and 64% higher the, the prior five year period average. So, India is now mainstream for investors, and these opportunities and the growth I just mentioned uh, are attracting a lot of interest. And a lot of these deals are in technology and, and, and what we call the digit, digitally accelerated sectors. And then Again, fueling that is growing income levels. Um, GDP per capita, as I said earlier, was 2000, which is where China was in, in 2005, 2006. Uh, and that GDP per capita number is growing at a rapid pace in India, uh, helped uh, in, in, by, by you know, technology development and so on and so forth. So uh, to your point, you know, the names of some of the companies we've invested in are well known. Uh, I'll mention Baiju's, Flipkart, Delivery, uh, around e-commerce, ed tech, logistics, IT services. We've made a number of investments there as well. And we're looking at a number of uh, innovative companies across a number of sectors around the world. Uh, and India will play a large part in that. So sorry for the long answer, but this is a topic that actually gets me uh, quite excited uh, about, about the prospects in your country. Thank you, thank you. Let me, it's a time just to take one question from audience and I'll, I'll take just one, one, one question. Uh, and I thought as much that this will be on ESG. Um, ESG, sustainable financing. I don't think any conversation can end without talking about that. So very quickly, your views, we are committed to that. Uh, we, we definitely uh, giving a lot of importance to, and I'm sure CPP is also thinking the same way. Uh, your quick, quick views on those. Of course, Sunil, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick because of, uh, because of time here. But uh, yeah, you, you, you're right. We've had a long-standing focus on on sustainable investing and ESG, um, and uh, you know we we truly do believe that companies that manage ESG factors well uh, and are deeply committed uh, to to ESG are, are more likely to create uh, financial value over the long term. And those that don't will destroy value for shareholders over the long term. Um, and uh, we think that you need to consider ESG risk and opportunities to be better investors, uh, to enhance returns and reduce risks, frankly, for, for our investments. So we don't we don't blindly rely on third party scores for ESG, though. We we actually try to 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 to, to go through our own filter uh, because otherwise. Uh, these can be quite opaque or, or actually sometimes contradictory. So we did launch a climate change program in 2018, and that's a, a multi-year initiative. Um, and that's to help us protect our current holdings against climate related risk, but also cr capture opportunities created by climate change. And we've made a lot of progress since then. Uh, we've integrated the assessment of climate related risk and opportunities that are into our investment process. We also believe that the successful evolution to a lower uh, carbon world is absolutely contingent on a shift in the global energy mix. Uh, and so we've been focusing on our efforts on sustainable energies, including renewables, uh, distributed energy, uh, electric vehicles, and, and, and all that. Uh, and we've invested about $20 billion through our sustainable energy group. And we look to double that investment uh, over the coming years. Uh, and that's going to be very, very important to us, as you can imagine. 
Uh, we've also launched a, a, a beta test of a sustainable equity long short investment program in the public markets. Uh, we're seeking to prove that there's alpha as well as risk mitigation in taking such an advanced approach uh, to ESG. Um, so, in a word, you know, the, the focus on ESG, the importance of ESG in our investment process will only grow. As you can imagine, uh, the, the, the focus of the global investor base and, 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 and governments uh, on ESG uh, will also grow, and we're committed to staying ahead of that. Great. Uh, thank you for your time. And I know you are heading for your investment committee. Good luck with that and uh, really appreciate. I also wish very good luck to your colleagues in uh, Bombay, Sujit and Vikram and others. Uh, all the very best and thank you very much for, for doing this for uh, Fiki. Thank you.